Hello, Vrishali and Raj. How are you? Um, so I guess we'll start with updates. Uh, if you want, who wants to go first? Yeah, hello, I'm already there. Yeah, hi. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I wanted to say, uh, like, I thank you for the midterm evaluation. It was, it's like my uh, first stipend yeah. I have earned. So Great. it was, it was, I'm really happy for that. So yeah, so I'd like to say thank you for that, Bradley and Jesse. And yeah, uh, about my update, I apologize for not being able to work much this week due to my examinations. I will have some free time this weekend. I'll complete all the documentation related work that has to be done on the Orthogonal Labs GitHub page. And I'll also resume my uh, reinforcement learning stuff. I'll keep you guys updated on the Slack as and when I find time. Uh, from the first week of August, my college vacations would be starting. So I will be working full time from August first week. So till then, I'll try to uh, work as much as I can in between. Okay. Uh, so, uh, have you thought about like sort of a strategy for reinforcement learning? I mean, how how do you think you're going to approach it? Um, and you don't have to give any like a specific roadmap, but just kind of like how do you want to yeah. approach it? Um, initially, I was think I went through a Himanshu's models that he developed last year in NetLogo. So I was thinking that the uh, best approach would be to try and convert his net logo models into MISA models so that I have a template to begin with and then that model can be defactored and uh, modified as we desire. So initial, my initial thought process was to try and convert his net logo models into MISA models. Right. Yeah, I think that's good. That's a good way to do it. And then it'll give us not only a MISA model at the end and, and it can be refactored accordingly. We also then can do the other models later. I don't think it. I don't think the other models are as. I mean, I, I don't want. I want. I don't want you to spend like all your time just kind of doing that. But uh, I think this would be a good test to see. And then, you, of course, you can work on. I guess you're going to also work on improving the model a bit with respect to the reinforcement learning itself, right? Yeah. So then that's. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So then that's often, you know, an, uh, a lot of work <laughs> just to get that up and running. And then now, so you've had your, you've done the stuff with the, uh, the web interface and with some of the hosting issues. And then with now you're getting into the reinforcement learning and you're working on one model, getting a template down for that. I would suggest for this that we have a workflow sort of mapped out. And this would be like something you'd put in the documentation so that we could have a, a model going forward. Like, you know, how a lot of projects will have like a, a model for doing, you know, like a, a, well, they'll put it in XML. You don't have to put it in XML, but like something where there's a specifications model for uh, doing something. So how do you get some a model into MISA and get it to run in the framework? I think that's, I mean, then then maybe into like next year we can have someone work on continuing with some of these workflows and, um, yeah. Thank you for the update. Yeah, I'll look into that as well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, again, you can use the Slack as a, a feedback tool or a question-asking tool. That's good. Thank you. Okay, uh, Vrishali, are you there? Are you able to... <laughs> it's like you had trouble with yeah. your... Uh, yeah. Uh, my network was a little bit slow. Uh, what was that? Actually, uh, actually, I'm having errors in my network right now. So oh, okay. That's, sorry. That's uh, okay. Uh, uh, and I don't have uh, much updates right now because I just came back yesterday uh, from the conference. So 
uh, I will be sharing my insights or whatever my experiences tomorrow in the group, like uh, group meeting. Okay. Uh, like I am prepared, and plus I wrote the blog about my experiences and what I got to learn and whatever stuff I learned there and the connection I made. So tomorrow I will be having the presentation kind of stuff on little bit sharing my experience. Oh yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Uh, it sounds like that was a nice conference. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more about it. And, yeah. So this next week you'll... It was, oh, go ahead. No, no, this, this week only, like tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was nice. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah. Okay. So your this coming week you'll be able to work on continue your project and and uh yes. working on it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh and I'm sure you got your evaluation as well. So yeah, everyone passed and I gave feedback to people. And I think it's, you know, good to have feedback. And the feedback I gave was like, you know, kind of a summary of where we are and then like maybe next steps. I always try to do like a next steps thing so we can kind of move into the next phase of the project and get a sense of, you know, what needs to be done. So the next next phases of the project, of course, we're heading into August and we have, you know, kind of in the back end of it, like I said before. And so we're thinking about documentation and we're thinking about how to kind of get this down to something that we can submit to uh, Google because they want a submit a submittable at the end of the project. Um, sometimes that's a, an executable file. Sometimes that's a library or something. And sometimes it's just, you know, well, usually it's like a library or an executable. Basically, they want to be able to go into a certain location. You'll have to submit a link at the end, and then they'll look through it and say if it's an executable or if it's like a, I guess a portfolio or a library would be good too because a lot of projects don't have an executable. But basically, uh, in the past, I've had students create uh, gists or maybe like a GitHub repo, uh, readme where, you know, they put together like a summary of what they did and the files and a description of the files. So it's kind of like the readme you would create for a repo, but it's a little bit more formal. And they, uh, you know, want you to just kind of summarize what you did. So it's not like a huge undertaking, but you do have to be, like you do have to think about all the parts that you've been working on. So, but that's not for a while yet. So, but you have to think in, you know, you have to start thinking about it now. <laughs> How am I going to kind of finish up things? Um, and, you know, you can't do everything. Maybe you can't do everything you had proposed. That's fine. But uh, where where's our, you know, kind of point where we want to say this is the project, at least what's going to be submitted and what what's not in that basket. So, like, you know, if, if everything you think, okay, this these are the things I want to finish, uh, and it'll take me a couple weeks. Then you have a nice timeline. You're kind of rescoping things and saying, this is a nice timeline to the, the finish line. And then, you know, if you want to finish it later, you can, but usually it's just what you want to submit. Now, if you want a little bit of extra time, like I said, I, I've requested it, but I haven't heard back yet. So they'll be probably doing that more towards the end of the, the formal end of the program. So... But we'll we'll deal with that when we get to it. Um, you know, I don't want to request extra time if it's just like well, I want to do finish everything. Uh, we'll we'll evaluate where we are, sort of maybe next week and in, in the coming weeks. You know, what 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 can we finish? What do we need to finish to make it look like a substantial project? Um, what is that document or that that submissions? document look like or that submissions file so like what's in it um you know is it like uh, a bunch of files that you know are connected is it a executable what is it and then can you describe what it is and what 
to, you know, you have to kind of give a contribution to um, the, the project. So I think, you know, if you just say, you know, we talked about these things and, you know, we've driven the project forward in these ways, you know, whatever ways that you've uh, basically, you know, in Rishali's case, she's created assets, creating an environment. In Raj's case, he's working on uh, different reinforcement learning strategies, improving some of the models, uh, building an uh, improving the interface. So those are all things that you're going to say in that document and point to the files as evidence. So that's that's where we want to go in sort of from here on out. Um, but I think both of you are doing well. Um, you know, it's like I, every year I get like uh, we get into the project and then we always have to sort of modify what we're doing a bit. And that's actually quite normal. Um, and the reason they want you to do a, a schedule in advance is because they want to see if you like, they want to make sure that you have like a sort of a tight, <laughs> uh, plan. And then of course the plan never really fully unfolds because they're always thing, you know, different directions you want to go in different problems that occur or different, uh, you know, maybe it isn't just the right, uh, thing to do, but that's, normal. That's what you're going to find in any work environment, where if you go into academia, any academic environment, is that those often happen with projects. You can't do everything you want to do in the time frame you want to do it. And that's why we have this huge industry of like project planning and uh, things like that. It's like, <laughs> how do I make this more efficient? How do I fix things that are... <laughs> Uh, not good. But I think both of you have done pretty well in that regard. I've had students that have done wor a lot worse in terms of like, you know, <laughs> kind of hitting the milestones or kind of juggling things. But it, it, I don't think anyone's done really bad. It's just that like, you know, I think it's project dependent. Sometimes you'll have problems with, you know, finding the computational resources you need or computers crashing and things like that. So it's that's just... It's normal stuff that happens and but um yeah i've never failed anyone and i don't think i will because i think i always try to keep people going you know like um but i yeah i don't think that's useful to fail people on us on this um yeah so thanks for the updates um how are you jesse uh i'm okay um, it's been a busy week for the other projects, as you know. Um, I don't have any. I don't have anything super planned for today, um, like mentoring project, uh, professional development. Since I, I could talk a little bit about um, uh, the nature of of showing. To people in a work environment that you're you're doing stuff like like how to look like how to look like you're doing things when when you are it's kind of like self representation and how that kind of depends across different cultures that's a bit on my mind from from things no I guess cultures literally but also like workplace environment or the workplace environment cultures mm -hmm. um, but I don't know like uh, that's that's sort of the topic on my mind, but I don't know if you want to talk about it now or later. Or yeah, we could talk about I, it now. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to. I, I don't want to. Definitely, like fifteen minutes maximum. Yeah. Hopefully, ten minutes. I don't. I, maybe five minutes. Even I don't. I don't want to spend. I, I feel like I spent way too much time uh, last time. About something. Well, we could do fifteen, I guess. Um, um, yeah. So. I I really like uh, for for really good advice. This person, she's actually on Instagram, which you know is one of the social media power platforms. Um, I forget what her real name is. She has a book out, but her her tag is a power mood, which is kind of, um, you know, kind of badass. But it's really good advice, and it's it's from it's it's often targeted at. Um, women or minorities, or things that are maybe not explained to everybody. 
And I mentioned, I actually mentioned her at the Nickway conference, um, and she posts a lot of good things now. I think I mentioned her last time as well. Um, but thinking of something that she said recently, which fit very well with my own experiences recently, is that, um, you know, as, as you have more experience across different work environments, you kind of understand what people are looking for. Bradley, Bradley and how Bradley manages Google Summer of Code in the lab is a very particular way. Mm -hmm. I would even say a somewhat unique way, even amongst um, other mentors and leaders and, and, and environments you come across. So the things that Bradley's looking for and the things he emphasizes may be unique. Uh, and typically they are uh, for every for every manager or whatever. But like, you know, what what's how Bradley interprets progress versus momentum is unique to Bradley. And so how you communicate yourself and show progress or, or to, well, progress or show momentum um, will be, you know, that, that's kind of your own evolving process of that. When you get into different environments or like particularly industry environments um, or like for-profit environments, there can be very different kinds of incentives or kinds of things people want to know. And I feel like, I, I know I've kind of said this a few times in different ways during the context of these kind of discussions, but um, it's so much about kind of gaining a literacy for what the company is trying to do and then knowing a little bit of how you want to, how it is that you want to communicate uh, around that topic. It's kind of like making a landmark. I feel like I feel like it's you pick a landmark, and I, I use this term for many things. But I feel like when you're when you're in the context of that, um, when you're trying to intentionally communicate value or effort or show what you're doing, you kind of have to pick the goal of the company or the organization as a landmark and say, "Hey, relative to this, here's what I've been doing." And sometimes, uh, particularly for, I would I really say any environment. Some are, are a little better than others at, at trying to recognize you. Um, but for most, like especially corporate or industry-based things, um, learning how to sort of promote yourself, uh, how, to, how to show your work, how to communicate the, the, the challenges you've worked on and the solutions you put into them um, is a really um, is a is a really important I guess skill set and also habit and also just like I would say a language or literacy how to do that all those things together and I guess I'll I'll conclude by, by referencing something that's happened recently in my own life um, where there was some like there was there was a meeting oh, that was scheduled with some like some key people and I was kind of secluded to it. And I had a bunch of different thoughts about what do I do in this situation because I'm tangentially involved in that meeting and, and maybe more than tangentially involved in some of the topics of that meeting. But I was just kind of like, you know, you just get this invite to a meeting and it's it's like, hey, uh, you know, what do you do? And I feel like there's a few different options that crossed my mind. One of them was, oh, I don't want, I don't need to do anything. I don't want to rock the boat. Uh, one of them was, I think the other end of the spectrum, which I don't normally do, but the other end of the spectrum would be kind of writing a, an email to everybody, including the, the most critical person in there saying, hey, what's this meeting? I don't know anything about it, et cetera, et cetera. And then there were some middle ground options, which are the ones that I took uh, in this case, which was sort of directly contacting the person who made the meeting and another sort of person that I, person of relevance that I'm, I don't know, uh, not a matter of trust, but more like that would be appropriate for me to contact. And I think I'm going to reference, um, I copied this from yesterday from last week's meeting. Um, I'll reference this again. This is such, such a great chart for me. Um, <clears throat> this, 
this one. Um, I feel like I, I basically in this case asked both my manager or a manager and a peer for advice on what to do in this situation. Um, because I asked, I asked the person who made the meeting, I said, Hey, and just, just to even be a little more like in, give a little more insight into the, my like decision making about it. Um, I originally wasn't going to ask them because I, I just didn't know them really well. And I thought, mm, maybe I should ask someone else first. And I, I'm, I'm kind of glad about my choices because what I ended up doing is asking both people. And I, 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 I kind of made myself go, okay, I'm going to professionally reach out to this, man, this manager who made the meeting that I don't know very well and say, hey, I see this is sort of a relevant thing for me. Um, I prepare or anything? Should I, you know, what should I expect? And I'm glad that I did that because it turns out in this moment, um, the meeting was created in a way where the, the other person involved in the meeting didn't really know about it either. So I accomplished a few things by doing this in that one, I showed the manager who made the meeting, the one who sent the invite, Oh, Jesse cares. Jesse gives gives a damn about this. He's he's on, he's paying attention and he wants to succeed. So showing that you care, or showing that you want to understand, is a good thing to do. Kind of whenever you can, uh, like like showing some assertiveness and reaching out for clarity, uh, particularly about expectations or goals. Um, uh, I think it's always good to clarify goals. And honestly, I would say if you're in a startup environment, especially, um, or a, any kind of a not big company with very heavy infrastructure and, and very, the, the more bigger the company, the more like uh, mechanical things tend to be and the more slower the feedback. But in a smaller company, uh, you may be the, you literally may be um, the the only or the the only other person thinking about asking about clarifying something, and it's kind of really important that you do that. Not because people are being negligent, just because sometimes there's so much stuff going on, and the decision makers have a lot on their plate. So, really understanding that in certain environments, it's actually really important that even if you're not sure, you can speak up. You can you can ask questions and ask for clarity about it. Um, so I'd really emphasize that for um, smaller companies or or more like open source or less structured things um, in particular. That that's a really nice thing to be able to do. And then ideally, you can. I basically asked in this particular context. Sometimes the roles between what these people are changes a little bit. But in this particular context, I basically asked the manager and another manager or someone who's a little bit more of a peer. But if you can ask different people who know different things, you can you can kind of confirm or deny some stuff. Like when you ask one person they don't know, then you can you can kind of help identify should this person need to know or you know whatnot. You get information that way about business practices and goals. So um I guess I guess I'll leave it at that, and and, and if Bradley or other people have questions or follow ups, you can do it. But it's the, the takeaway message for me today is um, a great way to show that you care about stuff and to show your value that you're a good employee or whatever it is is by asking questions to clarify goals or to clarify uncertainties. Even even if you're unsure about it, um, you don't. I guess you don't want to overdo it. I guess in certain ways, but if you're if you're not sure, um, and you're trying to get a read on things, and you're not you're trying to understand um, what 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 the culture, the communication culture is. Um, I think it's good to even if it's even if it's just. A simple message of, hey, I saw 
whatever X, Y, Z, I saw this meeting invite, I saw this message, I saw this email, uh, could you, could I, could I ask for more context about this or is there anything I can do to prepare towards this? I think just simply doing that when the opportunity arises is generally a good thing to do because even if there's nothing for you to do, which may be the case, the fact that you asked and the fact that the manager or the decision maker or the person in charge of leadership stuff knows that you're caring about it. And then ideally you back that up with actions when the time comes. Um, that will be a really valuable thing to, to, to make uh, a normal practice for you. So that's my small lecture today. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I have a uh, couple things to say about it. I noticed that Ankit's here. Welcome, Ankit. Thank you. Um, first thing is that we have a lot of times you do have this cultural thing in, in a lot of organizations, and there's this expectation that things happen a certain way. So especially in open source, you know, a lot of times you'll have like, meetings and then you know the, the meetings are really the glue that holds the project together so you might have uh, check-ins or stand-ups and those are usually like weekly or day that's what we're doing now is a sort of a stand-up we do at the beginning of the meeting um and just you know it's a way to keep people on task and those are pretty straightforward but you know sometimes they're not useful uh depends on the working group if you're not uh so active at some point in time versus another point in time. Like if we had these in the winter time or in, in like uh, uh, November or December when we didn't have GSOC projects, we might not have anything to say, you know? Uh, yeah. Nature of stand-up meetings. And those are actually come from the agile uh, process where, you know, they're constantly iterating their projects and they're constantly building new versions of, you know, they're constantly improving the project and they're really kind of built for speed. So, you know, if you have like this thing that's going on that, that's, you know, intense and always changing, it makes sense to do meetings. But if you're not, you know, maybe not. You don't do <laughs> stand-ups when um, maybe like a weekly meeting where people present on things every three months will suffice. So like, you know, we have... Uh, you know, sometimes we'll have, like, someone will give a presentation on their progress. I know in, in academia, a lot of times lab meetings will be where the people working in a in a lab will give a, a lab presentation every three months. This is what I'm working on. No matter if I've done very little or done a lot, I'll put it in there and say, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I've done. And it's just a marker to say I'm, I'm accountable for this period of time. I'm doing things. And that's on the, the organization, the culture there. Some organizations don't do that. And I think it's kind of to their detriment because I think it's always good to make, to keep people accountable and just say, yeah, um, you know, I've, I've been working on this. I haven't made the progress I'd, I've liked, but, you know, and then, but see, people can help you when you get it out there and you're transparent about it. People can say, oh, yeah, I can help you with that problem. I had the same problem before, or I have this method that I've used that might help you. I mean, I, I had that experience when I was in grad school. We had lab meetings, and we would talk about, you know, um, an idea you might have had in talking with some other person, and then there's another person who you wouldn't think would be helpful is suddenly helpful because you're all in the same room and you're talking about it. The other thing about meetings is that, you know, sometimes you can have meetings that are um, just, you don't know why you're there or what, the, what you know, people will, there's, a, in some organizations, there's a practice of putting meetings on calendars without uh, someone's consent, which is not, <laughs> sometimes it's not a, like, you know, sometimes there's a standing meeting and you get invited to it, but sometimes it's like, I want to meet with you on Friday afternoon at 4.45, and it's like, oh, no. And that's like, you know, the, but that's that happens some, in some organizations. They do that. and But sometimes, of course, those meetings are not necessary. They could be an email. You've heard that adage where you could have done this in an email. 
Um, so that's that's the thing about like a lot of these things. And I think the clarity issue is good because I think, uh, you know, always asking for clarity is good. Um, but sometimes it's, you know, um, I, it depends on the culture of the organization. I could say that could be misinterpreted sometimes um, as, you know, it's not always viewed as in taking the initiative. That's the only thing I would add to that, uh, that it's not, sometimes it's viewed as, uh, you know, it, it just really depends on the culture of the organization. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I would I would absolutely follow up on that by saying there are certain, particularly in the context, I think, of, like agile stuff, when when you're when you're developing things, a lot of times the emphasis is this doesn't exist yet. We need you to make it happen. So if you're constantly asking for clarification to that end of it, like how do I do this? How do I do this? And it's, again, it's not it's not a I'm, it's really tough to talk about this because I, I think for someone who's in a, in a junior situation when you're coming into something, um, you do really want to get the context. So the, asking for the context to start out with isn't a bad thing. But I think a way where you don't want to over... A, a way where mm, when you're making things specifically, which is probably most, maybe even maybe more relevant than what I originally said, to be fair, maybe more relevant to Google Summer of Code, right, or other specific, you're the developer, you do this stuff, is understanding the question and and think and and saying, I, I guess I guess this applies to other contexts too. But if you understand the need for clarity, and you can, it, I think it's, I think it's it's always it's always an ideal way to say, if, if, if I guess I guess I'll put it this way: if you need, if you truly need clarity in a place where there isn't clarity from a from a goal sense, okay, that's a that's a that's fine to just ask that question. If you're in an operational sense or in a developing or a building sense, or a, a how do we find a solution sense, if you can understand the need for clarity and prepare a potential solution or a set of ideas saying, hey, I've thought about this and I'm kind of thinking about doing this. Do you think these options are good? And or like, here's my progress. Uh, that that can take it to a different level of uh, you're, you're it's a lot more engaged that way. And I think the, the more the more a situation is about just making stuff or doing things or like creating literally creating or ma making software otherwise. I think the lean is to that end, too. Um, and then it kind of gets into almost kind of what we talked a little bit about um, last time in terms of getting feedback and also um, uh, like demo or, or, or deploy, deploy or die, like, like knowing how to show your work relative to what you're doing. So, you know, it kind of, the, the, the relational points of the message that you're trying to send change, the more you can show, hey, here's a, here's something that I'm building out. And as long as you can confirm that what you're building uh, matters to the goals that you're doing, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's tough. And I guess the last thing I'll say is, um, it, the more experience, why, why, why I think it's great to really encourage the communications in Google Summer Code here now, like like practice these, these messages and these communications here because the, the, over time you, you get a sense of context and experience about how to, I, I honestly feel like it's, it's um, if you learn how to drive in America, so much of their course called defensive driving for a car. Like like you learn, it's this framework of how to, how to be, how to defend yourself on the road. It's, it's like one of the ways they talk about it. I feel like business communications is basically defensive communication in the sense of not that you're being overly quote unquote defensive, but you kind of have to understand um, and get practice with knowing how to comment on things in a way that 
like like exactly like Bradley said, sometimes you're you're not going to want to ask a bunch of questions about clarity. Sometimes it's much to your benefit to say, "Here's what I'm doing, and here's what's related to the problem," and and demonstrate a lot more and ask less. But it really depends on the situation. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. Um, now. Uh, Inkit had some questions or comments in the chat. He said, interesting agreed comms vary. Yeah, so different forms of communication are good for different things that you want to do. Um, and then, hmm, I see Agile is quite popular, but do you know of any other frameworks which have survived and worked well in practice? So I actually teach a little bit about this in project management. Um, so Agile was invented around the year 2000. And it really came out of like a lot of the needs of software, you know, moving fast and breaking things and, you know, that sort of culture. And then the things that preceded it, of course, were we, you know, humans have been making huge projects for, you know, millennia. And there are probably different project management styles there. But, uh, you know, in the post-World War II era, we had things like waterfall uh, and other methods Waterfall being where you specify each step with documentation and then you build it and then you revisit it later and you build more documentation for the next version. And it's documentation heavy, but it's instructive mass, you know, it's it's um, sort of maximally instructive to each step of the process. So they have a different style of communicating. And in fact, Agile was a reaction to that saying we want to get rid of this bureaucracy and you know, move fast. But the problem with moving fast, of course, is that that's too fast sometimes. And sometimes you break things and you don't fix them later. You can't fix them sometimes later. Um, so if you build something really quick, you do this quick iterative style of building things, you, there, you miss out on a, a couple of things. You know, one is that you miss out on reflecting on each step you know, you reflect on some weighty ethical issue or some weighty technical issue that you maybe can solve with a patch, but you can't really say, oh, yeah, this is really a bigger problem than <laughs> just patching it. Um, that's one. And then the other, of course, is that their documentation sometimes suffers and you never recover because you say, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll write it later. And, of course, you don't. <laughs> Because you're always like moving on to the next thing. Um, there, there's this related issue of technical debt, which I had a yeah, I had a student, a GSOC student, who really enjoyed that topic, and I put it into my project management course. And it's basically this idea that any project has a certain amount of debt with it, associated with it. So you start out a project sometimes with debt, but when you make decisions that are sort of spur of the moment and don't really address the deeper causes or sometimes just because you have to adopt certain technologies to make things happen, you have this debt that you have to pay back later. It could be like just kind of uh, trying to maybe move it, move your technology, scale it up or move it to a new platform or, you know, you could just write code without documentation or, or, um, annotation in the code and just no one knows what to do with it. So like I've seen projects where like people will write code to move very fast, but then no one can understand the code later when you want to have new people come in. And so then you're, you know, you're out, out of luck. You're out of luck. Uh, so that's, that's where that debt comes in. And sometimes uh, Agile really kind of maximizes that debt. Um, so Jesse says, if you're a dev in a big team of devs, typically you might just have to focus on the target you're given. Yeah. And that's also, that's not agile dependent. That's sometimes just a thing that you have to do. If you're at a more managerial level or put in the position of coordinating software or tech development with many other things about going to market, it can be another set of challenges. Yeah. And integrating those visions is, is a problem because if I'm, up here in management, and I have a vision for like the different versions of Microsoft Office that we're going to have, and you're doing like some, you know, you're you're kind of working on the code level. You know, we have to be in in alignment with that, an agreement, and that's what happens with a lot of software is that management is 
different from the developer's view what's possible what the roadmap should be it's not sometimes not great um you know. no. and, and there's a lot to say about this i don't I, i'm gonna cap myself uh, but I, I i any questions about this you want to ask us you can um and i, I would also just say like I hope that benching this isn't intimidating, but more a sense of trying to lightly gesture towards context that you can think more about in whatever your actual future workplaces are. Because, you know, I don't expect you to be coordinating all the different streams of development, but at the same time, being aware of that, even as even as just the, the, the humble software developer who has to just, okay, my manager said this, I gotta do this, like, that might be what you have to do. But as things change and you can show understanding of other, other stuff, um, it, it will definitely be a good thing to do. Um, and, and even to the extent of understanding that there can sometimes, even a very well-meaning, very good, very, very intelligent people, very, uh, you know, impressive, whatever, they can still have major gaps in understanding of what different parts of decision-making want to do. And and part of why it's so important to understand them is that the more you can be like literate of those gaps and of the differences of those things, the the, the more you don't get caught up in those gaps. Because when you get caught up in the, you know, because sometimes the CEO is going to want to talk this way, and the, the CTO has well, we got to have this tech priority, and you know they want like they'll be frustrated, and then you'll you'll have to speak on something and you have to understand, well, this person knows this, this person kind of knows that. <laughs> like, how do you talk about this stuff? So, again, um, that's that's higher level stuff for later, but it's important to um, be able to talk about this. So, in the future, if you want to talk about this thing, we'll, we'll be here. So. Yeah. So, Ankit says, I don't imagine this to work in research with respect to technical debt. Um, yeah, well, yeah, research actually is interesting because if you're doing research, and I'm not talking just software, sometimes you do have problems like that where you have like um, methods that are old and there are better methods that come along, but you're kind of locked into those and uh, locked into sometimes into tools that you bought like 10 years ago. And that can be sort of a form of technical debt, but more often than not, it's also about training. So you get people who are really maybe good at using a microscope and you have to train someone new if they leave. And if you can't find someone, then you don't have that expertise anymore. So it's yeah. like stuff like that. And and I guess it works that way in software. If you have like, you know, a really good team and they go away and then you can't really replicate what you had. Um, and then Ankit says, because when one thing blows up in research, everything will be just by just do it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it'll, I mean, you know, there are ways around your technical debt, but you have to keep in mind that you may incur more debt <laughs> as a result. So, yeah. Uh, Inkit, I wanted to know if you had anything you wanted to say. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to say this week or mention. I know we have... Uh, not really, not specifically. Uh, I think like uh, he has already given his update, right? I think yeah. Regarding, yeah. I think he told me that he's like he's having his exams and stuff, so probably not much could be done this week. But uh, yeah, tomorrow I think I'll probably like. Uh, uh, I think Jesse was talking about like that mid mid uh, that what do you call it that mid. Uh, what's the document called that you just shared recently? That write up? Um, the notion notes or the mid year update? Or yeah, the mid year update. Okay. So I made like a document template for that that I thought would be like a lot more like formal. So I'll share that I think in tomorrow's meeting. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, thanks for that, Ankit. Um, yeah, I want to finish up with... Some, actually, we were talking about research and software, and I, I do want to talk about that in a minute. Let me share my screen. Uh, I'm going to talk about... First, I want to finish up on this 
idea that I, I talked about two weeks ago, relativity and virtual worlds. So I talked about a bunch of uh, things like tools for uh, looking at general and special relativity and virtual reality. There's this toolbox, open relativity, and uh, there's, you know, there are ways that you can probe this area that maybe are, you know, something that people haven't really done, but it's also something you can only do in virtual reality. So let me go back here to the folder. Uh, so this is the paper that I wanted to talk about today a little bit. This paper, The Physics of Now, this is by James Hartle, who's a physicist at UC Santa Barbara. And uh, this paper is it's just kind of a speculative thing, I think, uh, where he talks about the world is four-dimensional according to fundamental physics, governed by basic laws that operate in a space-time that has no unique division in space and time. So that means space-time is a single thing. Yet our subjective experiences of this world is divided into present, past, and future. So, you know, there's this idea in physics of the space-time where everything is located, you know, all your fundamental forces and things like that are embedded in this space. But our subjective experience, when we go into an environment and interact with it, we have this model of, like, the present, but then also the past and the future. And so that that's sort of a, what is the origin of this division? What is its four-dimensional description? Could you describe the present, past, and future in a four-dimensional way? And actually, in virtual worlds, you do have this four-dimensional aspect. Like, you do have the time variable, past, present, and future, but you also have the spatial variables that you would have in space-time. So you would have, you know, your X, Y, Z, and then you have other uh, coordinates or, or other dimensions that exist in higher order space times that we don't really have. Uh, the people don't think you've thought about in virtual worlds, but may be possible. So he talks about this sort of thing, how it reviews such questions through simple models of information gathering, utilizing systems such as ourselves. Past, present, and future are not properties of four dimensional space time but notions describing how individual IGUSs, whatever, those are uh, information gathering and utilizing systems. So that's what he breaks this down as, uh, process information. Their origin is to be found in how these IGUSs evolved or were constructed. The past, present, and future of an IGUS is consistent with the four-dimensional laws of physics. So this is where we're bridging this gap and can be described in four-dimensional terms. The present, for instance, is not a moment in time in the sense of a space-like surface in space-time. Rather, there is a localized notion of present at each point along an IGUS's world line. So this is just a way that he's kind of come up with to think about these uh, connections between space-time and, you know, physics and things like that, and then, like, modeling that is part of our experience. And maybe a virtual world can bridge that. Um, so this is something that, I, again, I wanted to just talk about briefly because I'm kind of thinking in this direction, but I don't know. Uh, maybe there are other things that people can add to it if you're interested. We can follow up on it. Um, it's at a pretty early stage, so I'm not going to really kind of get into it anymore um, than that. But uh, I also then want to talk about uh, this area of software research. And it's, um, so there's this area, and I'm, make, I'm just making you aware of this. Uh, we may talk about it next week and the week after, but there's this area called research software engineering. And this is an emerging area. So, um, you know, software engineering is its own area. You do a lot of these project management approaches to um, sort of get a sense of, you know, how to build software. There are all these methodologies out there. Research software engineering is a little bit different. Uh, it's so why science needs more research software engineers. Research software engineers are people who build uh, software for research and they're engineering software specifically for research. So a lot of research is, you know, is computer computationally intensive these days and it requires people to, uh, you know, have a software engineering background, a formal software engineering background to get in the game and sort of 
build software. And this has implications for uh, research, but also for software engineers who are interested in this. So this is kind of almost what we do here, but we don't, you know, this is this is a profession. This is actually a profession with a group, uh, with a professional organization and everything. So um, this is in March 2012, a group of software developers gather, gathered in Oxford for what they called the Collaborations Workshop. They had a common vocation, building code to support scientific research, but different job titles. So this is something that you find also with postdocs in academia. You have this category in people's minds of what this is, but a lot of organizations name them different things. If they hire someone, it's under a different title. And so when you do that, it, first of all, it's hard to find the positions to apply for them. But secondly, it's hard to really define the scope of what is involved in this thing. So, you know, we know what software engineer is. Everyone hires a software engineer. All, a lot of organizations hire a software engineer and they call it a software engineer. And it has specific uh, guidelines or what that job is and what the skills are. So we can have uh, like a curriculum in a university that would teach you those skills that you can then take into that field. Well, this is an area, of course, that's very much um, in flux and hasn't really been defined yet. So there are a lot of different job titles that kind of do the same things. You can pick the skills up in different ways, but there isn't like a professional curriculum for this. So this is what they're trying to resolve a little bit. Um, so the research, uh, the attendees of this event coined a term to describe their line of work, research software engineer. And so this was in a decade ago now, uh, the people have kind of defined this field and what they do. So uh, fundamentally, RSEs build software to support scientific research. They generally don't have research questions on their own. They develop the computer tools to help other people do cool things. They might add features to existing software, clear out bugs, or build something from scratch. But they don't just sit in front of a computer and write code. They have to be good communicators who can embed themselves in a team. So this is something that, you know, we teach here uh, that these are all skills that you would use for this area. Uh, what sorts of projects do they work on? Uh, so any field of science runs on software, and the idea is to build software to sort of get at uh uh, scientific problems. So, you know, traditionally, uh, scientists have just run their, written their own code and run it, and they didn't worry about a lot of the things that a computer scientist would worry about, like efficiency of code or documentation or, uh, you know, running the code optimally on different types of data sets. You know, these are things that are, were sort of outside of that informal sort of code writing. And so, you know, now, now not every area of science needs an RSE, but this is something that, uh, you know, as you get more and more complex pipelines, you need these kinds of professionals to help. Uh, so this is something that has uh, great applicability across fields. Um, and, you know, if they have the money to hire an RSE, they will. And it's, but it, it's its own sort of, um, it has its own sort of set of things that, lead to research on their own. So like it's derivative research from like a project. So if you have a project looking at a certain type of cancer and looking at cells involved in a certain type of cancer, looking at gene expression in those cells, those are all questions that are scientific. And then there's scientific research engineer questions, like how do I design a piece of software to analyze these data? It might be combining microscopy data with gene expression data and bringing that together in a single pipeline. So those, that's the kind of thing that they do. And so I think this is, you know, this is something that uh, PIs have to be aware of. They have to be able to write it into grants. They have to be able to create space for RSEs. And of course, you know, they need that those skills, but they also need to understand that RSEs have their own questions that they want to work on. So how do you become an RSE? Uh, they, their advice is, you know, try working on a piece of open source software. Well, that's what we're kind of doing in this meeting. If possible, do some training in a collaborative setting. If you have questions, talk to a working RSE. Consider joining an association. The UK Society and Research Software Engineering can advise people about getting into the field. So basically, you know, this, this open source is a big part of this. And, you know, it's really kind of emerging. 
Um, there's a lot of, uh, so a lot of these papers I have are actually advice for people in uh, software, research software engineering, but also I have, then I have some other articles here on research. And I might talk about those next week because I think they're kind of a different topical area. But, um, you know, we have different things like how to read a paper, how to seriously read a scientific paper, um, the importance of stupidity in scientific research, and the science of writing. So these are all skills that you would learn as a research software engineer. You need to know so your software engineering, but you also need to know how to do research. And so I'm going to go through these next week. But the next, the last thing I want to talk about today was this uh, solving software's R and D conundrum. So software companies uh, tend to outperform their larger competitors in returns for R and D investments. So one way for a company to get to the sort of the top of the heap is to have a really killer product. But to get a killer product, you need to have research and development. Uh, you need to invest in it. You need to cultivate uh, researchers and developers of software, but as well as research, peer research. How do software companies ensure the scaling of research and development even as they grow? Software companies live by the mantra of innovate or die. As a result, research and development programs are among their most indispensable functions. The average software company spends about 20% of revenue in R&D. Some spend more than 40. The effectiveness of R&D teams, chiefly their ability to innovate, is in many cases a software company's most significant differentiator. So R&D doesn't scale with size. So if you have uh, smaller companies tend to outperform their larger competitors in terms of R&D investments and speed to market. And this is about this institutional inertia Jesse mentioned. If you have more inertia acting like a larger bureaucracy, research, you know, new research ideas have less of an impact. Partially because your organization is larger, but also because you don't just adopt like latest thing that you find. You kind of spend time putting it into a framework. So these are problems that larger corporations have, but they do tend to invest more in R&D. So there are a lot of trade-offs here. This may seem obvious. After all, older companies generally have more mature products in slower growth markets. But we found that market maturity alone doesn't explain declining RDIs. And they kind of go into some of the differences between organizations talking about when R&D lags, um, and you know they kind of talk about the differences in organizations here um, and the benefits of R&D. Um, so this is, okay, this is an interesting article. So these two articles, I think, oh, they actually also talk about short-termism and long-termism and some of the things. And this is an issue with research. You know, short-termism is where you just expect to pay off in the next quarter or the next year, and research is really antithetical to that. So we have to have a longer-term uh, outlook. But the problem with the longer-term outlook is that the uh, payoff for this comes later, comes maybe very much later. And so if we can, you know, build a culture where, you know, we can uh, sort of build in this expectation of uh, not seeing a return for five years or ten years, uh, then that, that, that makes it easier to apply research to software projects, to corporations, and so forth. So, you know, they have this issue, this, this part on how to scale R&D. You know, you have to have this longer-term product mindset. You have this architectural modernization that's a continual process. You have to eliminate organizational silos. You have strategic product op, uh, ops capabilities, which is where you invest in automation and you analyze your product and you do things that you know, help you understand what it is that you have as the outcome of research. And then you have this proactive customer change management, which is um, where you kind of uh, help customers adapt to the changes induced by your innovations. So when you create, when you have a research team or development team, they create innovations, they put them in the market, and then customers have to use them. And sometimes if you're Putting more innovations out there, you need more training, more people doing things that are different. And so a lot of times customers struggle with that. And it's sort of the other side of technical debt where it's now put on the burden of the customers and they induce this technical debt or of themselves of using the product. 
And so you need to train people on how to use it or introduce the changes in a way that's, um, you know, not disruptive to your customer base. So let me check the chat or a couple of comments here. So, yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah. We yeah, have special relativity in VR. Well, kind of, yeah, it was the relativity idea um, in VR. Uh, and sometimes you encounter people who make a new hardware, piece of hardware, and wrote very dense documentation about it that wasn't suited to non-engineers. Yeah, they used to release things all the time with really thick technical books. Like you would get uh, like a computer and you'd get these thick books that you'd have to like read through and try to figure out how to do things. Um, they don't have those as much anymore, but still you have, you know, you want to make it easy to use and not necessarily just kind of like throw this piece of machinery that's cryptic. I don't know how to use it. I'll give you like a 300 page manual. <laughs> Good luck. One of my first research situations in a neuroscience lab, I was sort of like the tech, I was brought in as like a semi computery person. Yeah. Just like set up this obscure cutting edge document that this engineer guy that we know just put it out and figure out how to do it, you know, no stuff for uh, open data and data management. I don't know if I just lost it, but it came back. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, I think our something happens connection, anyways. Uh, yeah, so that's good. And you know, I wonder if RSC would do well to be associated with the open data projects. And understand data management mandates for the NIH. Yeah, that would be a good thing too. Uh, although it's not really in that specific title, we could incorporate that. Uh, and then Ankit says, on that note, yes, both OpenAI and DeepMind were are at a loss to present long-term gains from short-term losses. Yeah, that's always an issue, especially with AI now. With it's moving so fast. Uh, standard operating procedure PF hardware. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, the, a lot of interesting topics there. So thanks for attending the meeting. Uh, it's time to wrap it up for today. Uh, and we'll have another meeting next week. Thank you. Take care, everybody.